What up everyone, Big Kev back in the building. Today we have another one from the Fat Electrician. This one's called the infamous Eager Weavers and their custom B-17 bomber, the old 666. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let's check it out. The story of a B-17 pilot and a bombardier, two anti-heroes that become best friends and assemble their bombing crew out of a bunch of misfits that don't fit in anywhere else, and they become adamant on doing things their own way. So much so that the US government won't even give them a B-17 to fly. They then proceed to build their own and become the most heavily decorated air crew in US history. <laughs> Today we're talking about Jay Zemer, Joe Sarnofsky, and their air crew, the Eager Beavers, the most decorated air crew in U.S. history, responsible for completing the most decorated mission in U.S. history, all while flying the most heavily armed bomber of World War II, Lucy, a.k.a. Old 666. Starting off with our pilot and main character, Jay Zemer. Born in 1918, he grew up in Pennsylvania with a pretty wealthy family. For high school, he was sent to a military boarding school in Culver, Indiana. While there as a freshman, despite the school's policy on no students having vehicles, he managed to acquire a Willie Motor Company Whippet, the direct predecessor of the Jeep. And he managed to turn this thing into an absolute hot rod, better than it ever ran before, until the school finally found out that a student had a car, which is against the rules, so he had a disciplinary meeting with the dean. He goes into this meeting with the dean, and he's like, look, I'm in the engineering program, I'm taking all the engineering classes, I want to go to school to be an engineer, I just rebuilt a motor, and I'm 14 years old, you guys should treat this as extra credit. To which the dean, being cool, is like, well, Take me for a test drive, and we'll see. Takes the Dean for a test drive. Yeah, baby. Dean has a great time. He ends up giving him extra credit and letting him keep the car the entire time he's at military boarding school. So his Smart kid. His grades were a little lackluster his freshman year because he was busy restoring a car. After that, he aced absolutely everything from sophomore to senior year. He goes on to apply to go to MIT to become a civil engineer. He gets rejected by MIT because his grades were lacking his freshman year. So he drives his whippet that he rebuilt all the way to MIT and he camps outside the admissions office for days until they agree to meet him. He then goes in and proceeds to persuade the head of admissions to let him into MIT. So he gets into MIT, goes on to become an engineer. While he's at college, he joins the ROTC program, which is like the pre-officer training program that they have at most colleges. While he's there, he ends up flying a plane, and he absolutely loves it. It is now his new goal in life to become a fighter pilot. So naturally, he applies to go off to Army Air School to become a pilot, at which point he is pretty much immediately informed there's a 0% chance that he will ever get inside of a fighter plane because he's way too big. At this point in time, they only let the smaller guys be the fighter pilots, and all the bigger guys had to go work at bombers, and Jay was a big dude well over six foot. So it's not exactly what he wanted, but it is the next best thing. No big deal. He goes in, does the paperwork, does the physical exam. Bad news, his eyes suck, and his vision is not good enough to become a pilot. So the Yeah, that will get you. The entire notion of being a pilot gets shelved for now, at least. He goes back to college, continues going through the ROTC program to be an Army infantry officer, and while this is going on, he's constantly researching on ways to make his eyes better. And he finally comes across this crazy optometrist named Dr. Bates, and he has the Bates method. Basically, this method wanted to treat your eyes like they were muscles. Bates believed that glasses enabled your eyes to be lazy, so he would crush his patient's glasses and then force them to do a bunch of eye straining exercises in hopes of building up better vision, similar to how you would lift weights to get bigger muscles. One of these exercises included staring directly into the sun. Obviously, with hindsight being 2020, this- I don't think that one held up. Didn't work that well, and it certainly wasn't recommended, but the young Jay Zemer wanted to be a pilot so bad that he was, in fact, willing to go out Outside every day and attempt to beat the sun in a staring contest. essentially trying to give himself a caveman version of LASIK. Obviously, this does not improve his eyesight. If anything, it makes it better, but it does highlight just how bad this guy wanted to be a pilot. Yeah, I broke my glasses once before the holidays, and I'm nearsighted and farsighted and have astigmatism, so it takes special lenses for me to see. And uh, it took a few weeks to get my glasses back. And during that time, my eyes got plenty strained, and the only thing that I got for it was uh, migraines for two weeks. Uh, my, my eyesight certainly didn't get uh, any better. So, World War II kicks off, standards get lowered, and he gets accepted into the bombing program. And from there, he becomes the top of his class pretty much immediately. He is so good at flying bombers that he can actually perform fighter maneuvers inside of a bomber, which is something most pilots would never even imagine. But not only is he naturally talented at it, he also works extremely hard. He could tell every single American, German, and Japanese plane and their capabilities just by their silhouette. 
friend or foe? No, you idiots. It's a pigeon. So Jay Zemer is hands down the best bomber pilot in training right now. And somewhere along the lines during training, he becomes friends with the best bombardier in training by the name of Joe Sarnofsky. This guy is basically the Larry Bird at putting warheads on foreheads. They hit it off. They become best friends. They have a ton in common. After they graduate from school, they get separate missions and they get separated. So early 1942, Jay Zemer gets assigned to the 5th Air Force and he's not happy about it because the 5th Air Force is also referred to as the Forgotten 5th. The reason they're called that is because they are stationed in Australia and their job right now is to basically run a containment war against Japan trying to slow them down and contain them to the Pacific. And at this point in time nobody cares about the Pacific theater. The entire world is watching the European theater as America and Great Britain fight their way through North Africa into Italy to take back France and eventually overthrow Germany. That's where the majority of the funding is going. That's where all the attention and glory is. That's the place where young motivated men like Jay Zemer want to be. But that didn't happen. So, Jay shows up to Australia. He is the FNG, the fucking new guy. Nobody trusts him. He has zero street cred. Nobody wants him in their crew. Now, this is partially due to the fact that he's a new guy, and that's just how it goes for new guys, sure. But mainly, it's because the Japanese are kind of kicking America's ass right now. It's mid-1942. America just got involved in this war. A lot of their pilots are inexperienced. A lot of their equipment's outdated. And everybody's giving all the funding to the European theater. So, it's not a great time. And you gotta remember, since this is 1942, America hasn't come out with the Hellcat or the Corsair yet, meaning that America has no fighter plane capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese Mitsubishi Zero. So even if the bombers did have a fighter escort, they weren't... Oh, wow, I didn't know that capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese Zeros anyways, so it has never been more dangerous to be inside of a bomber, and it has never been more important to have everybody in that bomber crew as good as possible to increase everybody's chances of survival. If so facto, nobody wants to risk it on giving a new guy a shot. So it becomes apparent to Jay early on that if he ever wants to get up in the air, he's going to have to do some gangster shit. So he goes over to the bulletin board, and on that bulletin board are the missions that are deemed so incredibly dangerous that they are volunteer bases only, and he starts volunteering for all of them filling in any position where he's needed. The majority of these missions would wind up being reconnaissance missions, which is where they're going to take a B-17 flying fortress. Instead of filling it with bombs, they're going to fill it with extra fuel tanks, equip it with cameras, and send it way off into enemy-held territory all by itself to hopefully get some valuable intel. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, a single bomber flying alone in enemy-held territory is extremely dangerous, and nobody is about to let their pilot or co-pilot be the brand new guy fresh out of school, so Jay just has to fill in wherever there's a gap. Over time, he winds up doing everything. He's a tail gunner, a ball gunner, a waste gunner, a navigation guy, a radio guy. He can do everything, and eventually he works himself up enough credit that they let him be co-pilot for a little while. And while he's working as a co-pilot, he figures out something very very important. You have to remember, he's an engineer. He loves taking things apart, figuring out how they work, why they work, trying to make them better. And while he's sitting in the co-pilot seat, he figures out how the Japanese Zeros are tackling the B-17s. You have to remember, this is 1942. The B-17s that they are flying are the B-17Bs. They are the first generation of mass-produced B-17s ever, and they have one fatal flaw, and the Japanese figured out how to exploit it. You see, the B-17s have a ton of machine guns all over them to defend themselves. They have a tail gunner, a ball gunner, a waste gunner on each side, and a turret on top. The problem is, none of those can shoot in front of the plane. The only thing the front of the plane has is two 30 caliber flex guns, which you can kind of see right here, which might as well be nothing at all when it comes to shooting down an actual plane. Later generations of the B-17 would end up getting more firepower and turrets on the front to help alleviate this issue, but at this point in time, they didn't have that. So the Japanese Zeros would approach from behind, well out of range of the machine guns, pass the B-17 all together, and then go and do a U-turn and approach the B-17 head on and shoot it down, where the B-17 had no way to defend itself. And that seems like a pretty big design flaw. During his time as a co-pilot, Jay Zemer caught on to this and developed a plan. Fast forward, Jay Zemer on his first mission, he finally got enough street cred, and there was finally a mission dangerous enough that they were going to let him be the pilot. Sure enough, a Japanese Zero shows up, does the exact same thing, passes outside the range of the guns, does a big U-turn, comes back to confront Jay's B-17 head on. As soon as the Zero gets within range, Jay takes his B-17, turns it up on a wingtip, and banks, exposing the belly of the B-17 to the Zero, forcing the Zero to go the exact opposite direction and down, putting it directly in the firing lines of both the belly gunner and the tail gunner, shooting down the Zero. 
And that is just one of multiple combat maneuvers that Jay has engineered inside of his head, pushing the B-17 airframe to its absolute limit. Fast forward into the mission, he lands the plane. That is super clever. Plane, no problem. The entire crew gets out and swears that they are never getting on a plane with Jay Zemer flying it ever again. <laughs> and that becomes a new norm for a couple months. Jay went from the new guy that nobody trusted to fly to now he's so good, he's crazy, and we're scared to fly. That's definitely a good guy to have on your team, for sure. 30,000 feet. But if he did, he had Willie. Next, we have camera expert and waste gunner, George Kendrick. Typically on a B-17, you're supposed to have one waste gunner on either side of the plane, but Kendrick preferred to man both sides completely by himself. When Jay Zemer asked him if he wanted to find another waste gunner for the other side, Kendrick said, and I quote, these are my guns and I'm gonna shoot all of them. I don't need to be bumping asses with another guy while I do it, which is, the most American shit I've ever heard in my entire life. Next, we have Johnny Abel, a 19-year-old farm kid that's so mechanically gifted that he is deemed more valuable as a mechanic on the ground than he is a member of a bombing crew. Despite that, he wants to be a pilot. So, Jay is teaching him how to become a pilot, but in the meantime, he's the topside turret gunner. Next, we have the tail gunner, and he is the biggest, fastest, strongest man in the entire 5th Air Force, Herbert Pugh, a.k.a. Pudge. There was a couple other stragglers that came and went, went on a couple missions here, a couple missions there, but this was it. This was a core group of men that became best friends and went on the most dangerous bombing runs and reconnaissance missions that the war had to offer. Because of this, they very quickly built up an incredible reputation and became too valuable to lose, at which point leadership doesn't let them go out on the dangerous missions anymore, and they send them out on a regular bombing run with like 10 other B-17s, and if that wasn't bad enough... What's the point of not using them on the most dangerous missions? If they're if they're not the best ones to do it, you think you want to have your best guys doing some of your hardest missions. I mean, I understand not wanting to lose them, but you got to use the talent you have if you want to win. They're going to make Jay and his men be the first bomber in line, which if you don't know, is the safest bomber in the entire run, because as soon as their bombs hit the ground, that's what alerts the enemy that they're even there. So when they go through, there's no enemies manning the anti-aircraft guns. So they're done and gone by the time there's any enemies returning fire. It's that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth plane that faces the real danger, and that's just not okay with Jay and his men. So they go out on the mission just like they're ordered to, and they are the first ones to drop their bombs, just like they're ordered to. They make a clean getaway, they get out to open ocean, at which point Jay tells his men, get ready for a fight, because he does a U-turn, goes back in, flies over the enemy compound at a thousand feet, while his men from the ball turret, the waste guns, and the tail guns open fire on the enemy's anti-aircraft positions on the ground, literally becoming a ground attack plane like they're an antique C-130. They were able to knock out all of the enemy spotlights and most of their anti-aircraft positions, and every single B-17 on that mission made it back home. So Jay, the Eager Beavers, and all the other B-17s on this mission make it back to base completely okay, at which point, Jay is treated like a hero by his commanding officers. No, I'm just kidding. You see, the commanding <laughs> officers can't give themselves a bunch of medals if their men are defying orders but doing the right thing because it makes them look bad. So naturally, Jay is somehow the bad guy here. So he and the eager beavers are all confined to quarters pending court martial. The makes sense. You kind of you kind of saw that one coming. Even though you uh, want you to defy orders in the military, they, they usually don't take that very well. The only reason that Jay and his entire crew weren't kicked out of the military right then and there was because there was a journalist in Australia with the 5th Air Force that heard the story from one of the other B-17 crews and they reported on it, writing a story that would end up getting read by a congressman that wanted it investigated, and he demanded and ordered that chain of command to give Jay, Joe, and all of his men on that air crew a silver star. So at that point, Jay and all of his men get a silver star. Leadership just kind of has to drop the issue, but also, fuck these guys. We're not going to give them easy missions anymore. <laughs> We're only going to give them the hardest missions we have. And if they die, they die. We don't really care anymore because they made us look bad. Which is exactly what Jay and his men wanted all along, so it all works out. All right, fast forward. Next big dangerous mission, officially known as Flight of the Geishas. Naval codebreakers have deciphered enough messages to figure out that in the city of Rabul, there's a hotel, and the penthouse of that hotel is being used as an exclusive officer's club where they are being entertained by a bunch of geishas and getting hammered. And among those officers is rumored to be none other than Admiral Yamamoto, the leader of the entire Japanese Navy. Their mission is to fly in with a single B-17 under the cover of night, bomb that hotel, take out all the high-ranking officers, and make a clean getaway. So Jay and the crew get pulled in, they get briefed on the mission, no big deal, everybody's gonna go off to bed, they got a big day tomorrow. Everybody 
except for Joe Sarnofsky. He stays up all night long studying the map of the city of Rabul. Nobody knows why. They just think he's overcautious. They go to bed. Joe stays up. Fast forward the next day. They take off on their mission. Jay flies them all the way there, gets them real close to the hotel, at which point Jay can actually send the controls of the plane over to Joe Sarnofsky in the bomb bay so Joe can control the plane and really line up the shot that he wants with this bomb. So Jay sends the controls over to Joe. Joe opens the bomb doors and veers way off course, miles and miles off course, like 10 miles off course. Joe steers this plane essentially blind, driving the plane just from what he can see outside of the bomb bay. And then before anybody even knows what's happening, Joe just says bombs away, drops the bombs on a seemingly random location and sends the controls back over to Jay. Everyone is completely confused. Nobody knows what's going on. The bombs make impact and there is a humongous explosion, way bigger than this 500 pound bomb could have ever done on its own. Joe had just hit a major ammunition depot for the entire Japanese Navy and his single bomb set off a chain reaction blowing up the entire facility. Come to find out, Joe Sarnofsky didn't feel right about killing innocent geisha girls and he decided that he was going to find a target that was just as if not more valuable than the officers club and blow that up instead. So they make it back to base, tell leadership everything that happened and leadership is absolutely furious that they decided to do their own thing instead. They interrogate the entire crew, but nobody is ratting on Joe Sarnofsky. Yeah, something big in jail. Say that now. I, I did. What you say? I told him all bang in life. So as a punishment, they're ordered to do the mission again and this time do it right. But that is essentially a death sentence because now they know that the Americans are bombing the city and they're going to be on high alert. Yeah, right. I mean, there's no getting in under the uh, cover of night this time without someone being alerted. So they're just going to do it anyways. And I think leadership was actually trying to get them killed, but it's not really going to work out that way. So crew goes to bed early. Joe Sarnofsky stays up all night again, studying the map of the city of Rabul. And yet again, the same exact thing happens. Jay gets them all the way there, completely undetected, sends the controls of the plane over to Joe. Joe opens the bomb bay, veers way off course, miles and miles off course. And he does it again. <laughs> bombs a seemingly random location, and there is an even bigger explosion than the day before. It is an enormous explosion. Jay had just taken out a major fuel depot again for the entire Japanese Navy. They make their way back to base, at which point they are effectively grounded and leadership will never give them a B-17 to fly again. I love the fact that after they disobeyed orders, clearly wasn't even like a question by bombing that other place, that that ammunition depot. They just let them go right back out again, thinking like to follow orders this time and then are shocked when they go and do their own thing for a second time. They did tell you the first time that, that the, your orders don't really mean much to them. So you can't be all that shocked the second time around. Because they refuse to follow orders. And they are given absolutely no credit for single-handedly bombing major fuel and ammunition depots in the city of Rabul. All right, so leadership's being a bunch of dicks. They're not going to let Jay and the Eager Beavers fly any more of the good B-17s, which sucks because at that point, there's really nothing that they can do unless they plan on building their own airplane, which which is exactly what they do. So Jay and the Beavers go out to the Boneyard, and the Boneyard is not just where planes go to die. They go there to be cannibalized for any good parts they may have left to keep all the other planes still running. And what they come across is what used to be a B-17. It has been stripped of every usable part and is covered in bullet holes, and there is no way that this thing is going to fly. The only identifying characteristics of this plane... Yeah, well, that's, uh, that looks a little rough. ...at all was the faded word Lucy up on the front and the tail number 2666, which would later bring about its nickname, Old 666. So now they have a plane, they just need to fix it. A seemingly impossible task, but they have Jay Zemer, the engineer, and Johnny Abel, the 19-year-old mechanical prodigy, that set forward restoring this plane, while everybody else on the crew goes out and steals all the parts they need to do it. I mean, strategically transfers equipment to an alternate location. Some of the equipment huh. that the Eager Beavers managed to acquire included four new cyclone engines radio equipped yeah i mean uh, you it's the fact that they were able to like comp basically steal four cyclone engines is pretty pretty nuts and do this with no one finding out about it seems seems pretty wild camera equipment and 1950 caliber machine guns right off the bat we have a problem no one misses 19 missing machine guns i mean i know there's a lot going on during during the war and everything but 
don't these guys have other didn't they get assigned to other duties aren't they supposed to be like in other places isn't like the military usually pretty regimented about where their people are supposed to be at what time they're supposed to be there at because right around the time that the beavers start finding all of this amazing equipment a bunch of other air crews seemingly have lost a bunch of their amazing equipment so a bunch of them are going to go back and try to steal it off of old 666 at which point the only logical solution is for the entire crew to start living on old 666 while they restore it all day and all night and spread the word that the 50 caliber machine guns are loaded and if that doesn't work you get to fight willy about it at this point leadership has completely lost control of the situation everybody's calling jay zemer and the eager beavers pirates renegades everybody's looking at leadership to stop them okay so at least it's known then at which point leadership is kind of like Fuck, I think they might be talking to me too, and I don't want to fight Willy, so we're all just going to look the other way. Like we talked about earlier in the video, there's not much firepower at the front of a B-17, so they take a 50 caliber machine gun, mount it right on the nose cone, and they line it up with the rivet line going down the center of the cab, and they rig it up so that there's a button inside the cockpit for Jay Zemer to hit to be able to fire the 50 caliber machine gun. So all he has to do is aim the rivet line at the enemy and fire. He calls it his schnozzler gun. Then the other two 30 caliber guns on the front of the B-17 are replaced with 50 cals. The navigator compartment usually had one 30 caliber machine gun. Now it's gonna have dual 50s. Then the seat for the radio guy who typically never even had a gun. Oh, I mean, if you're gonna rebuild it, you might as well upgrade it. Well, we're going to cut a hole in the plane and give him 250 caliber machine guns as well. Then we get to George Kendrick's area, the waste guns. Typically, there's 150 caliber on each side. Double it! Now we're getting dual 50s on each side, and because that's not enough, we're also going to cut another hole in the bottom of the plane and give him dual 50s there as well. That way, when Jay banks up in front of the zero, not only can the ball turret gunner hit the zero, Kendrick is also going to be able to hit the zero as well. Then, in case any of the guns malfunction, they have three extra 50 caliber machine guns strapped down on the inside of the plane. Old 666 now has more than double the firepower of any other B-17 in the Pacific Theater, and after shedding over 2,000 pounds, it is also the fastest but all that firepower isn't going to be worth a whole lot if they don't know how to use it so jay and johnny continue working on the plane while everybody else is sent out to go train and become experts on the m250 caliber machine gun the beavers get to the point where every single member of the crew can assemble and disassemble the m2 browning in under a minute while blindfolded joe and jay also make it a rule that every gunner inside of their aircraft has to link their own ammunition belts and they're going to change up how they do ammunition you see at this point a b17 50 caliber caliber machine gun had an ammo link that went armor piercing round, armor piercing round, incendiary round, incendiary round, tracer. If you don't know, a tracer is like the little one that looks like a laser beam coming out from Star Wars. They do that so that you can tell where your fire is going and so that your friends can see where your fire is going. They start linking their ammunition so it's armor piercing round, tracer round. And they do this for psychological warfare because when you're shooting every other round as a tracer round out of a machine gun, it is going to look like old 666 is something out of Star Wars straight up shooting laser beams at the enemy. <laughs> So they finish up the plane and they start volunteering for every single dangerous mission that they can find. They volunteer for so many missions so often that they never actually got an opportunity to finish the nose art on the plane like you see all the other bombers have in the movies and in the old pictures. And that's why the plane never got a cooler nickname other than its tail number, Old 666. Now most of these missions, just like before, are recon. It is Jay, the Eager Beavers, and Old 666 going up into enemy territory completely by themselves. And every single time they come into enemy zero, they light them up. The new machine guns are incredible, and old 666 is the aerial equivalent of George Foreman on his second title run. It's big, he's fat, he's got terrible gas mileage, but if you're going to stand in the pocket and trade with them, you're probably going to get put in the ground. Allegedly, with the combination of increased speed, increased firepower, Jay's piloting tactics, and the entire crew's newfound machine gun proficiency, they were shooting down so many enemies that it became unbelievable. So the crew came back and people started doubting them. So they're like, fine, we're just going to rig up the cameras to turn on every time we start firing the machine guns. That way, we film us shooting down the enemy fighters. Which is <laughs> I like the fact that they like had to prove it, you know, how well they were doing. It's the most world star shit I've ever heard in my entire life. They were literally kicking so much ass that to get people to believe them, they had to prematurely invent the GoPro 70 years ahead of time. That's pretty wild. 
The beatings continue for a little while. Old 666, the Eager Beavers, and Jay Zemer build up this enormous reputation, and eventually leadership would approach Jay with the most dangerous mission he'd ever heard of. All right, so here's a mission. The Marines are gonna make a 40,000 man amphibious landing in Bougainville, but before they do that, they wanted to get aerial footage over the coastline because they wanted to find out where all the reefs were so the Marine Corps didn't get caught up on the reefs with their amphibious landing vehicles. The problem with that is the only way to get enough high definition in that footage to be able to see reefs that are underwater is to use a trimetragon camera setup, which is three cameras where they merge all the footage together. And the only way to actually film this and make it work is to fly in a perfectly straight line under perfect weather conditions, and they can't move the plane at all. Even a single degree of tilt would ruin the entire thing. And in order to film this coastline, they're gonna have to do that for 22 minutes straight in enemy territory, and that enemy territory may or may not have enemy fighters and anti-aircraft guns on the coast. And if there is anti-aircraft guns on the coast, it's pretty much game over because again, they have to fly in a perfectly straight line for 22 minutes straight in broad fucking daylight. The worst gunner on the planet has enough time to get dialed in and sh Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, not even be able, being able to move a degree, you know, during that period of time over enemy territory. I mean, I can see why that would be considered uh, such a dangerous mission. It's, uh, it's insane that, you know, someone even would take it. Shoot them down. And that's assuming they even make it to the coastline because Bougainville is 600 miles into enemy held territory. Because of this, the leadership only approached Jay with this mission because they were just hoping that he would pilot it. They never in their wildest dreams imagined that his entire crew would volunteer to go on this mission because it had such a low chance of survival. Despite that, after being briefed on the entire thing, Jay rushes over to the barracks where the beavers are, briefs them on the entire thing, and he's like, look, I'm calculating there's like a 10% chance that we survive this. I don't expect any of you to go with me. I don't blame you if you don't in any way, but... If you do want to volunteer, there's nobody I would rather have up there with me than you guys. At which point, every single one of the eager beavers stands up, and they're going with him. Who's Kyle going to take? Later on when retelling this story, one of the beavers is quoted as saying, We thought so much of Captain Zemer and his abilities that we didn't give a damn where we went just so long as he wanted to go there. Anything okay by him was okay by us. Jay then runs back over to the colonel that had just briefed him as he is pinning the volunteer slip onto the board to collect volunteers for this mission. Jay grabs a paper, crumples it up, says that him and the eager beavers are going to take the mission on one condition. He does it how he wants to do it and they have no further input. He will get the mission done. At which point the colonel agrees and it's settled. The only thing to do now is to get prepared for the mission and wait for army meteorologists to tell them that they're going to have a day clear enough to actually pull this off. It's monsoon season, a couple of weeks go by and then finally they get word from the army weather guys, hey, tomorrow's the day the weather's going to break, you can get this mission done. So they all get prepped and they take off first thing in the morning when it's still dark out for this dangerous mission. So they take off, they're making their way over to Bougainville, they get like halfway there, it's still dark out, everything's going great and leadership radios over to Jay and they're like, hey, Hey, by the way, um, extra credit, it would be pretty cool if you could pop up to the top of the island and film Buka Passage as well. We don't need trimetragon footage, just normal footage would work. You can do it while it's still kind of dusk out. If you could get that done too, that'd be great. At which point Jay is like, Look how they throw that in after they're already up in the air. No, I don't, I don't need extra credit during this extremely yeah. dangerous mission. That wasn't what we agreed to. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Then they're like, well... Too bad, it's an order. To which he just like hangs up on the guy. He doesn't really care. He's going to do what he wants anyways because that's been his MO the entire time. Okay, fast forward. They get all the way to Bougainville. It's still too dark out for them to start filming with this trimetragon footage. So Jay asks the crew and he's like, look, uh, I can do a U-turn. We can fly 15 minutes out over the open ocean, do another U-turn, come back. That'll be half an hour. That should be bright enough by then. Or we could fly like... 45 minutes north, film Buka Passage, and then come back and do this after. And the crew is like, I don't, whatever, I don't care. So they go, they film Buka Passage, then they come back. It is now broad daylight, so they start filming their trimetragon footage. They get five minutes into the 22 minute run, and they come up on a Japanese airstrip. And on that airstrip is over 20 Japanese zeros, and he can see men running out to the planes to come get them. Now, Jay doesn't realize it at this point, but these weren't just normal Japanese Zeros. This was one of the best fighter squadrons that Japan had that was specifically brought in to go take out Admiral Halsey. And in this squadron, they had two aces with a combined over 30 confirmed air-to-air -air kills. And oh, even damn. That's not, uh, that's not good. 
Even if this wasn't a specialized badass fighter squadron, 20 on one is still completely undoable. Yeah. They'd gone up against five, six, seven zeros. They'd never gone up against 10, let alone 20 plus. It's at this moment that Jay has to make a decision because he knows that by the time all the Japanese zeros get up in the sky, get in their formation and actually attack him, he's gonna have just enough time to finish this camera run. However, then he's gonna have to fight his way out, which is probably a death sentence. Or he could cut and run right now and he's almost guaranteed to be able to get away with a 20 minute head start. He's taken a second to weigh his options and really think about it and he's just about ready to cut and run and he looks down at the water and he can just see all these reefs just right below the water and he just envisions 40,000 marines and their amphibious landing vehicles hung up on these reefs getting cut down by enemy defenses and machine gun fire and he decides that he's going to risk it to try to save these guys. And for the next 17 minutes the crew gets ready for a fight as Jay keeps the plane completely straight and level in broad daylight as all the zeros get up in the air to come get them. Fast forward 17 minutes later, two dozen Japanese zeros have caught up to them and they are trailing just behind 666 out of machine gun range. Right as George Kendrick comes over the radio and says, give me 30 more seconds, three zeros pass along the outside do their u-turn to begin their attack run against 666 then george kendrick radios again that he has the film done at this point it's too late for jay to do his normal evasive maneuver where he plays chicken with one of the zeros so he just lines up the nose of the plane and his schnozzler gun with the lead zero shooting it down joe sarnofsky down below inside the nose cone manning those guns manages to shoot down one of the other zeros and the third and final zero was able to riddle the cockpit with 20 millimeter cannon fire this fatally wounds both jay Zemer and Joe Sarnofsky takes out all the navigation equipment for the plane as well as the entire oxygen system. Jay Zemer is now slowly bleeding out inside of this cockpit with no way of knowing where he has this plane headed other than instinct and a compass that he's holding in his hand and he has about 30 seconds of oxygen left before the entire crew passes out from hypoxia. And the remaining Japanese Zeros all now know that this is not a normal B-17. Their typical tactics aren't going to work and they just begin swarming every direction they can, firing from all angles. Jay immediately puts the plane into a nosedive, desperately trying to get below 10,000 feet so him and his men can breathe with the oxygen system down. He drops 15,000 feet in just under 30 seconds. That is over three miles in 30 seconds this plane drops before Jay pulls it back up and he estimates that they're at 8,000 feet. He doesn't actually know because the altimeter is broken and the only way he can tell the altitude that they're at is because he's such a good pilot he can look at the pressure gauge for the engine manifolds and be able to tell. At this point the entire situation devolves into an all-out chaotic dogfight. Jay, while still bleeding out, is pulling off combat maneuvers inside of a B-17 that most pilots would never even attempt and his crew instinctively knows how he pilots that they're able to pick off these Japanese zeros one by one. Your average dogfight at this point in time lasted for less than a minute and this dogfight would drag out for over 45 minutes. And oh my god I mean that's a that's a big difference in uh, normal time versus the time of that one. 45 minutes wow. And the entire time Jay Zamer is losing more and more blood and more and more control of the plane because at some point both rudders would become damaged and he would no longer be able to actually turn the plane using the rudders. But he's such an incredible pilot that he begins individually throttling all four motors throttling one side up and the other side down turning the plane that way throughout the course of this firefight the eager beavers shoot that's pretty incredible to be able to do that while you know wound it like that down and completely destroy five japanese zeros critically damage and send back a bunch of other ones and by the end of this firefight there's five or six left fully functional and coming to get them and they are almost out of ammunition and right as it looks like this is going to be the end the zeros peel off and do a U-turn as they have to go back because they ran out of fuel. At this point, Jay Zemer passes out and the co-pilot is finally allowed to take over the aircraft, something that Jay Zemer refused to let him do in the heat of the fight. For the entire flight back, Jay is coming in and out of consciousness and the last thing he remembers is them landing and the ground crew rushing in as he hears the medics say, get the pilot last, he's already dead. He would wake up in the hospital days later to find out that he had lost over half the blood in his entire body, but the intel that they had gathered was going to be used to launch Operation Cartwheel, a highly successful Allied offensive that military planners credited that success to the intel that Jay Zemer and the Eager Beavers had gathered. Because of this, both Jay Zemer and Joe Sarnofsky were to receive the Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, Joe would have to receive his posthumously. According to the accounts of the rest of the crew, he was struck by a 20 millimeter round during the first engagement. Despite that, he still managed to man the machine guns at the front of the B-17, 
shooting down an additional two Japanese Zeros before succumbing to his wounds. As for the rest of the Eager Beavers, four of them sustained injuries, but they all survived, and all of them were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for this mission, making this the most decorated air crew in U.S. military history, and making this the most decorated mission in U.S. history. According to the official Japanese reports, this story is highly exaggerated because according to them, they only sent up seven Zeros to intercept Old 666, and none of them were shot down. However, when you take into account the verifiable fact that Old 666 was hit with five 20 millimeter cannon rounds and sustained over 187 bullet holes, and the crew depleted all of their ammunition, literally thousands of pounds of 50 caliber rounds, it kind of sounds like the Japanese official reports are fucking lying so that they don't look bad. All that, all that kind of uh, other evidence definitely supports their account and not uh, Japan's account. That's, uh, that's for sure. In conclusion, now you know the story of Jay Zemer and the Eager Beavers, a bunch of young men that blurred the lines between bravery and insanity that ultimately were deemed so reckless that the government wouldn't give them a B-17 to fly, so they built their own and became the most decorated air crew in American history. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Whack, bang, out. That was a long video this time around. Uh, when you're editing this one in post-op, just cut out all the parts where I got teary-eyed. Those weren't emotions. My office is infested with onion-cutting ninjas. <laughs> Yeah, that was a crazy video for sure. I mean, I never heard the story of the Eager Beavers before, but pretty intense. I mean, it's definitely a, a noteworthy one to be able. I, I, I just don't even know how they were, you know, allowed to continue, you know, being deployed, you know, when they kept on uh, disobeying orders and then basically Frankensteining together their own B-17 and, you know, confiscating or acquiring the other uh, parts needed for it. But I guess they were so good that, you know, that the, the brass decided, you know, we got to put up with some stuff. It's wartime. You know, we'll use them while we have them and uh, go from, you know, go from there. But I, I can definitely see why they wanted them to volunteer for all the uh, dangerous missions because, I mean, they obviously were, you know, the best that they had. I always love these, like, little personal stories from the war. It's always great to see these, uh, you know, kind of individuals and what they had to go through and, you know, some of the, you know, heroic acts that they performed. And it's always uh, it's always inspiring to see. If there's any other uh, videos by the Fat Electrician that I should be checking out, definitely let me know down in the comments below. Until next time, have a good one.